today we are there are slides and you can download them if you like but mostly we're going to just uh, look at live examples of um, some of the tools that I use on a daily basis to get my job done. Uh, so uh, there will be links at the end of the slides that uh, refer to all of the um, the web pages that I'm going to show today, so you don't have to worry about trying to jot those down real quick or anything like that. Uh, you can get those links out of the slides. Uh, and as well, I'll be available on, I'm always available on Twitter. If you have questions uh, after the fact, you can always uh, get that uh, from me there. So, so today, you can just kind of relax and become familiar with some of the more useful tools that are out there for mobile web debugging. Um, all right. so. I am going to go straight to uh, screen sharing. Well, let's do let's do a couple slides. Hold on. The first thing we're going to talk about uh, if if you've done any um, mobile web development, uh, you've probably done it for iOS, uh, at least for iOS. And in the the bad old days, we had a sort of um, a limited console style debugging interface uh, built into mobile Safari. Uh, fortunately, we have a much more advanced thing with iOS 6 that we're going to take a real good look at today. Um, but uh, uh, if you are familiar with this uh, interface, the slide that's up right now, um, it's, it's time to take another look because uh, it's been drastically upgraded with iOS 6. But I think more importantly than debugging on the device, uh, specifically, I think when you're building a mobile web app, it's best to do as much as you can uh, in the desktop before you start testing on the device. Um, you can't do everything on the desktop because the touch interactions aren't the same and the processing power isn't the same. But it's great to get as much as possible out of the way on the desktop because debugging, even with the tools I'm going to show today, debugging on device uh, is not the most fun experience. Uh, so I'm a, a huge fan of the Chrome Dev Tools. People who are Firefox fans will be familiar with uh, Fire, uh, sorry, Firebug, which is sort of uh, similar in concept. We're going to look at the Chrome Dev Tools today. And I have a series of slides on this that I'm not going to show. I'll just jump over to uh, screen sharing. And <clears throat> just take a second to set this up. It takes a takes a little doing to get this running. And Jonathan, while you're getting that set up, I'll just let folks know who may have just joined. Folks, if you do have questions for Jonathan and what he's going to show you today, open your group chat widget. It's a little widget near um, Trey. It says group chat. Type in your questions, your comments, and send those in, and we'll take as many as we have time for at the end. Back to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Az. All right. Get this thing working. All right, should be able to see my screen now, yes. Uh, just yell at me if uh, you can't. We can see it. Excellent. Um, OK, so uh, today we're going to I have this Avalio web application that I'll use as a primary example for a sort of web app that we'll be debugging. It's a simple little uh, web application that um, allows you to search for domain names. So no big deal. It's just an example application. You type in a search query, and then it searches for all the different TLDs and gives you the results. Right here, you can star the results. And you can see the history of your searches and your starred items on the screen. So it's like a three-tab interface. Uh, and it uses a bunch of um, sort of more modern uh, web programming techniques like offline storage and uh, app cache and some other things. And, and uh, because of that, it's a great example to use for debugging because um, you're using these more modern techniques. You know, it's, it's, the question comes up, well, how do I get a look at uh, what's going on under the hood? Uh, so in the uh, Chrome desktop browser, you can go under this hamburger menu here to pull up your uh, a menu of options, and then you go under Tools, and then you get uh, the View Source option. You can also use uh, Command Option U to open this, or sorry, Command Option I to open this uh, in the uh, 
on the keyboard or uh, on Windows um, control and command. All right, so what that does is it pops up uh, this panel. I have it docked to the right-hand side, which I really like because um, when I'm working on mobile stuff, especially responsive web design type things, it allows me to scrunch the window down really small and I can see how the design reacts uh, at very narrow sizes. So I can sort of set it around, you know, roughly 300 pixels right around there and work on my smaller designs, you know, do a mobile first design and then add some media queries, et cetera, et cetera, and, and work my way up uh, uh, by just opening the window uh, as I modify the code. And this probably doesn't sound like that big it's only just the fact that I can dock this to the right hand side and resize the windows without without resizing the actual window. It's a very it's surprisingly useful for a simple little feature. Um, if once you start to get to very wide widths uh, and you want to have like a full screen type of view, you can go down to this button in the very bottom and click on it to swap to docking it to the bottom so you get a full width layout and you can actually uh, pop it out as well so that it's um, uh, you know in two separate windows if you say if you had like an external monitor or something like that Let's go back where it was all right So inside of the interface, uh, we've got a bunch of different tabs here, elements, resources, networks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we won't have time to cover all of these, but I want to uh, at least show you the ones that I use constantly uh, in, when debugging and developing. Um, so first is the elements tab. And what this shows you is that it's like an interactive tree view of your DOM. Uh, it's different than view source because it's view source just shows you the um, you know, the, the raw HTML as it was loaded from a web server. And for an application like this, that's not all that useful because it, um, you know, it changes at runtime depending on uh, how the user is interacting with the application. So you want this live tree view. Uh, as you can see, as I mouse around, when I hover over an element, it highlights in the main window and it's, uh, it gives me the dimensions up in the top left there, and it also shows me the margin of padding on the element that I'm hovering over. So that's very convenient. You can also see, if I click on it, you can also see the, the metrics over in this panel where it has uh, the margin in this sort of orangey color, and the padding is green. And it's, it's extremely useful when you're trying to work out some kind of layout bug, something's not uh, landing where you, you think it should. Uh, you don't like the way it looks, so maybe it needs a little more uh, padding or something like that. The client says, hey, could I get more space around the, uh, the top? Uh, this stuff is all interactive, so I can actually double click on this and use the arrow keys to increase the padding live right there. And until I like the way it looks, um, I, I do this a lot, actually, especially when I'm doing things like line height, uh, that sort of thing. I might want to tweak my tabs a little bit. by tapping on them. And in this panel here, we see the styles that are applied to the selected element. So that this, the search tab is highlighted. You can see that on the left, highlighted in blue. I can see the dimensions. And then in this panel here, sort of bottom middle-ish area, I have the, um, the entire cascade of styles that have been applied to that element. So if I scroll all the way to the bottom, that's the highest level stuff. So uh, you can see that the HTML, the font size, uh, HTML has a font size applied to it, which cascades down to that search tab, but it's got a, a line through it, meaning that it's been overridden somewhere farther down the cascade, or in, that, in this case, up in the panel. Uh, that's what all these line and stripe throughs are, is that those, these particular sort of default settings have been overridden somewhere farther down the cascade. So here you can see I've got some body input, body and input selectors, or body actually is what is uh, cascading down to that tab here, where we're setting the font family and the font size. And then I get a line height here. Maybe I don't like this line height, and I can use my arrow keys again to change that number up or down. 
can mess around with that and see the results in real time. If I don't like the way that looked or I want to see how it looks if uh, I removed it temporarily, you can uncheck the checkbox next to it and just completely remove that temporarily. You can check the box to turn it back on. And let's look at, uh, I want to look at the actual search results area and drill into one of the items. And let's say I don't like the, the line height of the spacing on this. I can look through my styles here. The line height's not there. There we go. So we have a line height here. Say OK. And change that, move the stars around so I don't look where they are. You get the idea. So it, these, these items are, these styles are interactive and you can tweak your design into shape um, however you like. Um, same goes for the DOM itself. So I'm going to refresh the page. Now when I refresh the page, it's going to throw away all the changes I made. Um, there's a new feature coming in uh, the sort of bleeding edge of the Chrome DevTools that allows you to actually map your, um, your environment here to local files and save your changes locally, uh, versioned and everything with uh, diffing and all that, just like GitHub. So there's a version coming soon that will allow you to change these, um, these uh, when you change these things, to save them. But right now, usually what I do is I just make the changes and then, you know, it's my CSS, and then I just go and make that change in my actual CSS file and save it. Uh, but that, that workflow is going to get a little bit better in the near future. Um, okay, so the DOM, like I said, the DOM is interactive as well. If I want to play around with things here, I can use the search. I could call this uh, results. Enter it, and you can see that changes over here. So this allows you to experiment with... Um, you know, whatever you like. And if I want to, for some reason, get something out of the way, it's, uh, it's not the piece I'm working on or it's blocking a lot of the window, I can literally just delete it from the DOM and it goes away in the window over there. So when you look at pretty much everything, uh, I think everything that you look, that you can see here on the screen is editable and will update in real time. So very, very useful when you're getting your uh, design and layout um, tweaked into place. A couple of other interesting things. Um, if you have a deeply nested hierarchy of HTML, it can be a little bit annoying to try and drill through the tree uh, in the tree view here. So what you can do is go down and okay. so change my window size a little bit. You can go down and uh, tap on this magnifying glass, or this search glass, and then go and click on specifically on the thing that you want to inspect. So that just lasts for one click. So you turn it on, the magnifying glass turns blue, and you go click something, and that drills down into the element that you clicked on. So you can see I've clicked on that input, that go button. So now there's something interesting about the go button, which is that when it's clicked, or when it's active, it turns green and it's got a little text shadow on there. And maybe I want to, uh, you know, sort of tweak that color. I want to mess around with that color, but I can't do that while you know I can't hold the cursor down and then go over here and mess with anything because you know then it's it's not held down and I can't see the results of the green. So what you can do if you want to. Uh, uh, basically interact with an element in its state that has pseudo selectors applied to it. At the top of the styles panel here, you can see this um, sort of dotted rectangle with the, uh, the uh, cursor arrow in it. If you tap on that, it gives you the option to check off these pseudo selectors. And if I check off active, it turns it green, and then below all of the, um, the appropriate uh, rules, or selectors with, you know, selected rules uh, become uh, editable. So they show up down here and you can mess around with them. So if I say, oh, I want to change the background color or something, 
think. Change that. I don't like that. I don't like the text shadow. Maybe put the color back. Oh, I like it better with the text shadow. So uh, that gives you a way to um, sort of uh, modify, interact with items in the DOM that uh, you're styling with pseudo selectors. I don't think I have any hover styles here. Let's refresh the page. Yeah, I don't have any hover styles in this, but you could do the same thing for hover as you can for active or, oh, here, here's a good one, focus. So I can go into, uh, drill into search form input, and I want to style the focus. So here I've got um, an outline around it. Maybe I want to see how it looks bigger. Be tough to miss that. <laughs> So you get the idea. Um, great. So uh, another panel that's very uh, useful is the Resources tab in the Chrome Developer Tools, where you've got um, visibility into all the elements on the page, which is somewhat interesting. Uh, but more interesting is that this is the only place that you can see any local storage. So if you're using WebSQL database, IndexedDB, local storage, session storage, cookies, or app cache, this is the place where you go to look at those values. Uh, this app uh, happens to use app cache, I'm sorry, uh, local storage. So if I click on local storage for this page, you can see um, the values that are stored locally. Uh, and as I interact with the UI, I'll come over here and refresh. Oh, it did it refresh live, actually, didn't it? Yeah. So you can see the starred key is getting new values as I add stars. I go to the start tab, remove things, they're removed from local storage. So this isn't really a talk about local storage or offline web apps. Um, we'll probably do one of those in a couple of months, but, um, but uh, this is where you go to interact with those sorts of, uh, those sorts of uh, local storage items. Network tab is interesting uh, if you're having uh, a, a slow performance, bad load time, come in here and see what's taking all the time, which things we're blocking. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a wealth of information in here. You can click on any particular item and get the, uh, let's look at some, let's look at one of the Ajax requests. Let's search for who. And you can actually see the AJAX requests happening in real time. Uh, and you can filter it down to just the XHR stuff, or you could just filter it down to images and just see the images loaded or just style sheets. Um, but typically, I would view all and just look at it in the waterfall view to see if I was having a, a, a slow uh, page load time or a long page load time, I should say. Uh, I could look in here and see what it is that's, um, that's giving me the problems. Uh, so network tab is very good. The sources tab is incredibly interesting. We could do an entire hour just on this. Uh, but on the sources tab, I particularly like uh, uh, the, the, uh, what you can do with JavaScript. I'm going to show you a couple things real quick about the JavaScript. Um, so when we, when we come to the sources tab, uh, you may have to open this little panel here on the left-hand side. It gives you uh, another way to view your resources. We'll show you CSS and JavaScript files. Um, I typically use it for JavaScript, not so much with uh, CSS. But we can look at, uh, let's say, value.js, which is the main custom JavaScript file written for this application. And you can set uh, breakpoints in the code. So this is amazingly useful. Um, and if we now get this breakpoint here, I'm going to star this item. And you can see the screen kind of grays out. Execution pauses at this point. You can hover over it, hover over any uh, any item and see what the, the basically what the story is with it at a particular point in time. You can step through the code. Uh, you can step over. But what's really really useful is that once you pause execution in a particular scope, you can come over here with the scope variables and actually see okay you know lm and e got passed in. What do, what do we have here? Oh okay lm. Can inspect the local variables. Um, 
you know, which takes all the console log and alert debug and all of that, all that crock that you have to add to your code to figure out what's going on when a variable doesn't seem to be getting set the way you want. And uh, you just pause the execution with a breakpoint and bang, you can inspect all your variables right there. It's awesome. So that's a really huge deal. Very nice. Move that. Another real nice feature here is that if we look at a minified file like say, Mustache, which is a formatting library, a templating library I'm using for this, um, it's, you can see it's all you know, one huge line of minified JavaScript. Not very useful uh, for debugging. Certainly not very useful for you know, picking through um, if I wanted to fix something or change something. Uh, so what you can do is, is click on these pretty print curly braces in the very bottom of the toolbar. I'll make the window a little smaller. So you can see it. These curly braces here will pretty print the minified code and actually give it line numbers that you can put breakpoints into, so that you can or you can uh, inspect the code minified without having to switch back and forth um, your sources on the server. So if you're actually debugging on something on a server and it's been deployed and all minified and ugly, then you can uh, uh, debug it without having to switch your um, JavaScript includes. Super nice. Timeline panel is uh, also good for memory problems. Um, it's extremely complicated. You could do uh, an hour on this as well. And you know, if you're lucky, you'll never have to use it. <laughs> um, if you're having uh, client-side performance issues, maybe a huge DOM with a lot of complicated opacity and box shadow, you might have uh, actually uh, a slow performance that's, that's just the browser trying to do calculations. And you can come in here and take a look and see if any of that stuff is, is what the problem is, try and pinpoint what the problem is. Uh, profiles and audits, I uh, don't use that much, so I'm going to skip over them for now. Uh, they are useful, but not on a daily basis, in my opinion. And then finally, the console, which allows you to interact with the DOM. Uh, you get all of the output of your console log statements. Um, you can interact with stuff. You can run arbitrary JavaScript here. Uh, this is this is also very useful. So I would say elements uh, and console are the two things I'm in the most when I'm developing. And if I'm having trouble with my JavaScript, I'll spend a lot of time in the sources panel. Um, all right, cool. So that's there is a ton of stuff to to learn about um, in uh, the developer tools, and there are links in the slides to uh, a couple of screencasts done by um, Paul Irish and Adi Osmani, uh, who are in the Chrome. Uh, let's see. One last thing, I, I do want to point out this uh, settings gear down here in the very bottom right corner. That's how you get access to the settings inside of, um, uh, oops, that's how you get access to the settings inside of the Chrome developer tools. Hang on, my browser's freaking out. Let's go here. Overtaxing my uh, CPU, I think. Computer's chugging, so sorry about that. Just giving me a second. Let me catch up. If we go, let me back in here. Come on now. There we go, Internet. I'm going to use the keyboard command to open up the dev tools, which is command option I. And this gear icon allows me to open up a bunch of settings and overrides. This is pretty useful, so poke around in here. Um, 
disabled cache, I pretty much always leave checked. Occasionally, you'll want to disable JavaScript to see how your stuff performs without JavaScript. Uh, all sorts of all sorts of good stuff in here. Uh, emulate touch events is occasionally useful, but maybe not as useful as you might think. Um, so all sorts of good stuff in here. You can really customize the interface a lot. And uh, there are keyboard commands for all this stuff. There's just a lot to learn. So um, get familiar with it and uh, visit the resources that are at the, in the link at the end of the slides. All right, so before we leave the desktop Chrome environment, I want to point out one more thing, which is uh, the Chrome internals. And you can access Chrome internals uh, using the Chrome colon slash slash protocol, I guess. And this gives you access to a whole bunch of like internal settings for Chrome. And, and there's maybe some fun stuff in here for you. There's only one that I ever use, and that is App Cache Internals. If you're working on a, uh, a web app or a website that uses App Cache to, to provide offline support, offline access to your website, you're going to want to get familiar with this. Uh, you can click in and view um, all the manifests that are in here. You can delete them, which is what you're going to want to do when you're working with it. Uh, and you can do the entries and make sure you, know, you see what's going on. You actually get some visibility into the application cache, uh, which is a tough thing to get visibility into otherwise. So this is useful if you are using app cache. Um, OK, I think that's everything I wanted to say about Chrome specifically. Uh, next, I want to move on to the, the topic of remote debugging. We're going to look at a bunch of different remote debugging options. So the, the concept here is once you get your um, application to the point where you can't take it any farther in the desktop browser and you need to start testing on an actual device, uh, you know, how do you get access to these same kinds of tools and make your life a little bit easier uh, when things aren't behaving on the device, but they are behaving on the desktop? and you need to get uh, visibility into the, the actual device code. So we've got a, sort of a, an unusual setup here. Um, I have a camera that is pointing down at, at my uh, Nexus 4 and, the, uh, and an iPod Touch. So we're going to be running some stuff on these devices and debugging it on the desktop. I'm going to use a couple different approaches for doing that. Uh, first, we're going to look at Adobe Edge Inspect, which is a, uh, a paid product. I'm not affiliated with Adobe in any way. Um, I don't care if you buy this or not, but it is really useful. It's well worth the money, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's like $9 a month. And uh, there's actually a free version that you can use with one device. If you want to use multiple devices, you, um, you need to pay. So you can play with it for free, and if you like it, you can pay to, uh, to do more devices. And then there are three components to Adobe Edge Inspect. First, there is like a server program that you install uh, on your machine. And uh, I have that installed here. It's just a plain old app. Hopefully my computer will make it through. <laughs> you can see here, it's just a regular Mac app. There's a Windows version as well. And when it's running, you get this little menu bar up here, little menu icon up there. I'll tell you that it's running. Um, all right. Now that's one element. That's that's basically the Edge server. You run that on your development machine. Then in Chrome, you install the uh, Adobe Edge Inspect uh, Chrome Developer plugin. So if we go to Tools, Extensions, you can see I've got a bunch of extensions in here. I've got them all shut off now um, just for the purpose of this demo. Usually I have, uh, have stuff, uh, a couple of things turned on. But right now Adobe Edge Inspect is turned on. And uh, then the third thing, third and final thing, piece of the puzzle, is that you need to have um, a native app called Adobe Edge Inspect uh, installed on your devices. So here I've got on these two devices, I've got Edge Inspect installed there and Edge Inspect installed there. What happens when you 
when you launch these, let's go here. When you launch them, uh, the app, the native app on the phone, on the phones, will look on your local network for any developer machines that are running the uh, the server. So you can see that I am running the server on this machine. Um, you can see that the phones can see uh, Unibody is the one that I'm actually on. And uh, uh, Air is my other computer where I have it installed. So now that I've got these on here, I can tap on the server that I want to connect to. And it talks to the Chrome uh, plugin or the Chrome extension. And this organized to shadow what's going on in my desktop browser on the devices. So what that means is, uh, this over a little. Now this is especially useful for cross-device testing for responsible designs. So let's look at, uh, let's just go back to Avalio, let's say. Now watch the phones. I'm not touching the phones. Automatically goes to those pages. I'm going to change the focus so it doesn't auto-focus. Hang on. All right. So if I go to, you know, as I browse around the web, in my desktop browser, the phones kind of follow me. So this is incredibly useful. It doesn't sound like that big a deal, but it's a huge, huge time saver when you're testing a design across multiple devices. Um, and there are clients, there are uh, edge inspect clients for iOS, Android, and the uh, Kindle flavor of Android. So you can see uh, this Boston Globe responsive design is shows up you know, a little bit differently depending on what how much uh, viewport is available. So very cool, but it gets better. Um, let's say that I want to go back to Avalio. All right, great. And now let's say I'm having some kind of problem uh, with like the DOM. Well, before I, before I do that, do, I should point out that the the any ac action that you do in the browser that don't touch the URL won't propagate to the phones. So like I just did a search, which is purely JavaScript and doesn't do anything to the URL. So that doesn't happen on the phone. So it doesn't shadow that kind of behavior. It also doesn't shadow typing, which is um, probably sounds bad initially, but actually isn't. It wouldn't be that useful if it did support typing. So uh, you actually have to interact with the keyboards over here to type. So let's say I do that. And do the search. So I've got results in both places. Now let's say I don't like the way that it's looking on the um, on one of the phones. There's a couple things I can do from the desktop browser. I click on the Adobe Edge Inspect um, uh, icon, and I can do a couple things. Let's say I'm doing t testing and I'm not the designer, and I see something wrong. Uh, right in here, I can click on this, this camera button. Now it takes a screenshot of all the phones that are connected, and it dumps them into this directory with, uh, so here's your screenshot of the Nexus. So you could say, hey, uh, you could forward this to someone or put it in Basecamp or whatever. Say, hey, something's wrong with the design. And here's the here's a screenshot of it. And oh, by the way, uh, here's a text document that tells you all of the settings, um, the relevant settings of the phone, like the dimensions of the screen and uh, the OS, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really useful. Small little thing, but really, really useful. But let's say we need to go even farther. And I need to actually get into the DOM. I want to, I want to interact with the Nexus. So you can uh, click on these angle brackets, and this gives me remote inspection into that device. OK. 
can be a little finicky depending on the network traffic on your local network. So we'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, but what it does when it works, which it usually does work, um, what it does is uh, gives me my desktop Chrome developer tools, but they're pointed remotely at the DOM on the phone. So let's see if it's going to let me look at it. Refresh. See if I can see if I'm communicating with the phone. Not yet. Now, in practice, this works fairly, very reliably. Um, I'm going to have problems because I've got uh, I'm doing the screen share. I'm also talking to you over Skype, so my network is totally maxed out. But we should be able to get it to work. Let me try it one more time. Just hitting refresh. Let's do my last try. Ta -da, there we go. Slowly coming. So there we go. Can be a, that that sort of clunkiness that I just went through. Um, you will occasionally have to deal with that. But once you get connected, it's awesome because you get all of the, well, not all of the features that we looked at in Desktop Chrome. You get a limited version, like there's no sources panel, for example. Uh, but you still can interact with the DOM. As I mouse over things, you can see them highlighting on the phone. I can interact live with the items just like before. And you can see that changed on the phone. And send console messages. So very useful. You get a nice remote visibility into there uh, with um, Edge Inspect. Uh, there's, let's see, there's a few more features here, but I'll move on. That's the big stuff. Um, and again, it's if you just want to connect one device to your desktop browser and just get that remote inspection stuff working, uh, then it's free, and it's like 9 or $10 a month if you want multiple devices. So absolutely worth looking into. It's a good, it's, it's pretty solid. Um, all right. So now let's look at something sort of similar, uh, but free. And what this is, is um, remote debugging in Safari. So this is Mac only and iOS only. So if you're not a Mac, uh, if you're not, if you don't have a Mac, uh, yeah, I don't think this works on Windows, the Windows version of Safari. Pretty sure it doesn't. Um, but what you do here is I'll close out of, close out of these. You can just, just focus on the iPod for a second. And I'm going to launch settings. And now inside of settings, way down at the bottom, there you'll find Safari. And at the very bottom of that, there's this advanced button. If you click on there, you can go in and uh, and turn on the Web Inspector there. And it gives you little instructions. I uh, see these Web Inspector connects to Safari on your computer using a cable. So this is not wireless like Adobe had inspected. It doesn't go over the network. So I need to plug this device in, which I'll do right now. So this is nice if you're on a plane, let's say, and you don't have access to a wireless network, or you're somewhere else where you don't have access to a wireless network and you can't use Edge Inspect. Or you don't have Edge Inspect. 
Okay, so once we've got this turned on, I need to open Safari on the desktop. Just waiting for that to launch. Oh, I just plugged in the iPod, so it's trying to launch iTunes. Sorry. <laughs> and Dropbox. All right, iTunes, go away. Keep your fingers crossed. See if Safari will launch. <laughs> oh, iTunes. There we go. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> so if you go into the preferences for Safari, there is uh, a tab called Advanced on the far right. And down the bottom, there's a, a checkbox that says Show Develop Menu in Menu Bar. So you watch the menu bar as I toggle this setting. You see the Develop Menu, you know, toggles on and off. You want it on. And if I go to Safari on the phone, and go to Avilio, now that the sort of these two Safaris are aware of each other. So now I go under Develop, and you can see the iPod Touch in the menu, and then there'll be a list of URLs that correspond to whatever tabs you have open. So I can click on that. It opens up Safari's version of the developer tools, which has a lot of the same sort of capabilities. Uh, here we can look at, um, uh, you know, the JavaScript. We can look at the DOM itself. Uh, it's, it's all interactive, like we saw with the Chrome Dev Tools. It's all WebKit under the hood. Safari, uh, Apple just put a different UI on it. Um, not the greatest. It's a little washed out there. Sorry about that. The, uh, the important piece is over here. Uh, you get the idea. Um, the tabs uh, are sort of a lot of similar tabs. Um, this database looking one is for local storage and stuff, although I find that it doesn't always work uh, in Safari. Um, we've got the instruments timeline. This is, again, this gives you network requests, layout rendering, all that sort of thing. So if I run this query, Oops, I forgot to hit record. If I do a different query, you can see what's happening on the phone in like intensely uh, detailed output. You can really you know, see exactly what's going on with these things. You can click on them to see the, the details of the request. It's very detailed. If you need to really, if you're having a real performance problem and you can't figure out where, it's a good place to look. Uh, moving on, breakpoints are here, just like we saw uh, in the Chrome Dev Tools. Very useful. You get the same sort of um, view into the scope at a given point. Incredibly useful. And then finally, your console log output. So Apple's design case, you know, is very sort of clean and, and minimal. So it's these are these are actually tabs, these teeny little buttons. So um, you know. You just got to know what you're looking for and hover over them to see what things are. But uh, it's pretty nice. But again, it's Mac only uh, and iOS only. All right, so let's look at a version that's Android that runs on uh, whatever whatever desktop platform you have. Uh, obviously, I'm going to put on Mac. 
It's the same kind of concept. But we're going to switch over to the Android phone. And this is a lot more fiddly, uh, as is often the case with the Android. And uh, there's a link at the end of the slide that will explain how to do this. There's a, a number of things that you have to have set up. Uh, first, you have to have the Android SDK installed. That is uh, um, not a difficult thing to do, uh, but if you've never done it, there are a few steps to it. You, you can click on that link, and it will show you. Um, uh, it will explain exactly how to do that. Uh, it takes a little while for it to download and install, so I'm not going to demonstrate that right now. Uh, what I'm going to do is just show you this documentation and, and just kind of demonstrate what it looks like when it works. So you can see there's a lot to do here. Uh, one thing I do want to call out um, is that to enable debugging on your Android phone, uh, it, in 4.2 it became an invisible setting. So on uh, Android 3.2 and older, you would go on your settings, application development. So on the phone, for settings. Uh, well, this is, this is 4.2, so it'll be different. On 4.0 uh, and newer, it was in settings, developer options. And then in 4.2, they hid developer options by default. So they have this kind of Easter egg thing where you go to about phone and you tap it seven times. And then the developer options show up. So you can see the developer options right there on my phone. And then you, oops, wrong one. Then you tap in there, and you just enable that USB debugging turned on. Now I'm going to plug this into the phone, or computer rather. And hopefully iTunes won't launch. <laughs> it shouldn't. So when you plug it, when you plug it into a computer, it uh, you get this dialog that wants to wants you to accept. Uh, basically, it wants you to approve this computer as uh, say that it, yes, it's allowed to connect to this phone. Let's say yes. All right, now I'm ready to rock. Uh, at least as far as the phone goes. All right, now like I said, Android's kind of fiddly, so now what we have to do is go to the command line and run this ADB command, it's Android Debug Bridge, and it comes in with the, uh, the Android developer tools. So it's, it's a simple command to run, it's just one line, but you have to run it. You have to know to run it. So here I am in my terminal window. And I can type ADB devices to make sure that the phone is attached. You can see that it is. And now if I run ADB forward and then TCP 9.2.2, blah, 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 run that. Now when I go to localhost 9.2.2.2, my machine doesn't crash. It will show me the tabs that are open in Chrome. I only have one tab open in Chrome. Here it is. And like this. And I get uh, same, you know, same thing that we looked at before. We get this very similar, almost exactly the same as um, the inspector with Adobe Edge Inspect, uh, but in this case it's you know free. So same kind of thing. Uh, the other advantage of this over Edge Inspect is that you are doing it over a wire, and you don't have to be connected to the network to do it. So this gives you the same sort of stuff. Again, you don't have, unfortunately, the um, the uh, sources tab that gives you the breakpoints, the JavaScript breakpoints. But you have 
But actually, in my experience, that's usually not the place where I have trouble. Uh, usually, the reason why I want to do this at this point, when I get onto the phone, I'm usually not having JavaScript problems. I'm usually having performance or memory problems. Uh, so I'm really more interested in, or layout problems. So I'm usually more interested in layout, uh, which is on the elements tab, and then my styles and that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm doing a lot of stuff at the console to try and figure out what's going on uh, and, and like why something's not positioned where it should be or whatever. And then you know, the timeline will give you a lot of information too. Um, okay, so that is, um, we're just about out of time. I want to quickly mention one last thing. Now, if you're building uh, hybrid apps with PhoneGap, um, you'll be building them just like regular web apps, but then you'll be uploading them uh, to uh, PhoneGap Build, or you'll be running PhoneGap locally. And once you're inside of there, none of the debugging approaches that we've talked about so far work, because you're running inside of a PhoneGap app, and you're not inside of a browser or edge inspect. Uh, but uh, fortunately, the PhoneGap team thought of this. And so what I'm going to do real quick is just upload a basic little PhoneGap app, little like a little web app into a PhoneGap build. If you don't know what PhoneGap is and you don't know what hybrid apps are, then you can kind of ignore this. Um, but if you are doing any hybrid development uh, using build, once you upload the app, you can just enable debugging right here. And what that will do is uh, run the build. This will probably fail. You know, this is just a just an empty folder, basically. But once once this is built, then you get this debug button because what it does is it injects some JavaScript into your index page, and then this debug button will give you the same excuse me the same kind of interface that you saw with um, uh, Edge Inspect, but it would be into your PhoneGap app instead of into um, you know Chrome or whatever the browser is on your device that you're looking at. Uh, so if you're using PhoneGap and you need to debug things, then um, then this is a great way to go. Uh, you can roll your own version of this, but you have to be a little bit more um, you have to be a little more savvy and read the documentation, uh, or ask me on Twitter. Um, but there is a way to do this without PhoneGap build. You can do it with plain old PhoneGap using the Winery library, which is what's powering all of these things that we looked at uh, under the hood. Um, okay, let me jump back to slides real quick and see if I forgot anything. But I think that's everything, and we have a couple minutes for questions. So uh, let me do that. Firefox. And then back to slides. Yep. Okay. So that's uh, everything I wanted to uh, share with you. I'm going to push the link slide to you. You can see just, just a couple of links um, for you. And if you have any questions, now would be a good time. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And we do have a lot of questions that have come in, as you can imagine. Okay. Yeah. We'll just take a moment to know. Do you have any color commentary you'd like to share about Google's newly announced Android Studio IDE? Um, I don't. Uh, I, I have not been, um, uh, I haven't had the free time to follow I.O., so I'm a little bit behind the curve, but uh, I'm very excited to, to read all the news about I.O. In fact, I wish I was there, um, and I'll be probably blogging about it a lot. So uh, I always post that stuff on Twitter, so I'll be sure to uh, tweet links out if people are interested. Thank you. Um, next question here from AD. Is there a way to hide overridden CSS rules, the rules that have a strike through? Um, actually, no. That's interesting. No, there isn't. So feature request. <laughs> Marlon would like to know, he says, I'm working on PhoneGap-based app um, targeting tablets and wanted to know if there are any recommended UI frameworks that handle views well. Um, any best practices uh, info would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, it's tough to answer that without knowing how complicated the UI is. But if, if it's a PhoneGap app and it's going to be tablets, then you probably can't do better than Sencha Touch for a complicated user interface. 
Uh, Sensor Touch is really good on tablets um, because they've got a fair amount of horsepower. They can handle it, um, and uh, it, it's just got great touch support and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I tend not to use it for websites because it's WebKit only, but if you are using a PhoneGap app on a platform that uses WebKit as the underlying rendering engine, then Sensor Touch is a good choice. Thank you. Um, Rick and Earl would like to know if you can recommend some IRC channels and forums for discussing development and debugging tips and advice. That's a great question. I'm not an IRC guy, uh, unfortunately, but I know that the PhoneGap team, uh, they do ha have a, an IRC, I don't even know how to say it, a channel or a room or whatever that they hang out in all the time. And they are literally some of the smartest people in mobile web right now. So you really couldn't do much better than uh, hanging out in the phone gap IRC. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. oh, a couple more questions here. Um, Franco would like to know, does phone gap Cordova or Trigger IO provide some sort of remote debugging? Yeah, that last thing I showed is remote debugging. So uh, it injects a little bit of JavaScript into your uh, index page and allows you to get a look inside at the DOM and you know the, the the console and all that stuff that we looked at. So yeah, just check that box. Thank you. And Earl would like to know if your books cover usage of the tools you are showing today. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. I know that the uh, I, uh, I honestly don't remember. I'll have to tw I'll tweet you that uh, after the fact. The reason I don't remember is not because I'm just an old part, which I am, but uh, because we've done the books are similar but different, and I can't remember if the the second edition of the Android book has this stuff or not. So I have to look. Thanks. Um, Stefan says the biggest problem he sees is the multitude of different devices that throw device-specific errors. We can't own all the phones and OS types. Can you recommend a good service for mobile debugging on live devices? Yeah, I mean, Device Anywhere is the big dog. Uh, I, I've i never used them. In, it, it sound great on paper. Uh, I haven't used them. I know I've talked to some shops that have used them and had good experiences. Um, so I would, I would start there. Uh, there's another one. If you Google for Device Anywhere versus, there's another one that uh, I'm trying to think Anywhere versus Perfecto. And those are the two that I hear people looking into, but I don't have personal experience with either one. Generally, in the real world, uh, with client work, um, People, the client usually cares about a couple of platforms that you test on and everything else is best effort. And if you take, and, and this is my, and I think you should, if you take an approach of progressive enhancement, uh, then you'll deliver a functional experience on devices that are kind of weak and uh, a nice polished experience on the better devices and you still allow accessibility to everyone. So if you start small and work your way up, then uh, you, can, you can get some good results. If your application is super complicated, it's going to be hard. Great. Thank you. Just a couple more questions here as we are. Just running over the top of the hour, folks. Um, a question from Awakish. Do you recommend using jQuery Mobile for UI along with PhoneGap? Um, if it suits your needs, uh, I like it. It's, it's well done. It's not going to fool anyone into thinking that your app is native, that's for sure. But I, I think trying to fool someone into thinking that your app is pure native is a mistake anyway. So um, I, I like jQuery uh, mobile for the use case where you are you have a web app and you want to also wrap it in, um, in PhoneGap. And you can basically use the same code base pretty much you know, basically everywhere. You might have some minor branching. but. Uh, you know, a lot of in a lot of cases, you can get away with building a, a web app and then wrapping it in PhoneGap and adding some additional functionality like you know, I don't know, camera or file system access or something. Um, so it's it's a, a solid choice, um, but it really all just depends on how what your app is supposed to do, what the goals are. You know, it's tough to answer in general. Thank you. Um, a question from Jason. He'd like to know: Do you have any experience with Canvas? OpenGL ES or WebGL debugging? No, zero. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, another one question here. Um, Pana would like to know: um, Can they debug game apps the same way? 
Yeah, it's kind of the same question. Um, if there's a DOM, you can debug it. If there's no DOM, then these techniques won't work for you. Perfect. And we'll take our final question here from Sam, who'd like to know, do you prefer Adobe Inspector or Safari for iOS? Um, it's funny. That's a funny question. I use them both, uh, and I and I and I wish I could say I knew why. I think I usually use uh, Edge Inspect if I'm on Wi-Fi, and I use Safari if I'm not. They're very similar. The Safari interface is a little buggy, um, so it's not my favorite. But if I can't get on a Wi-Fi and I'm having network problems, then I'll use it. But you can try Edge Inspect for free, so you might as well give it a shot. Great. All right, folks, that is all the time we have for questions today. So we are going to say a very big thank you to you, Jonathan, for presenting yet another outstanding webcast for us all and for sharing all your knowledge and expertise. My pleasure. Folks that attended today, thank you so much for attending the event. We hope you benefited from it. We want to let you know of a couple links that we did push out to you all in your group chat. So please, if you didn't open it yet, open that group chat. Good information there. We'll start with the first one. Jonathan's next webcast with us is June 20th. Uh, you don't want to miss that. He's going to talk about wearable computers, smart objects, and the death of the touchscreen. So please register for that. It's free. Also, we pushed out some codes to save you some money on Jonathan's book. He's got the iPhone book and the Android book. If you like what you saw today, lots of good information in those books to really help you with your day-to-day, -day, and that code we pushed out will save you some money. Jonathan, thank you again. Folks that attended, thank you, and we'll see you at our next event. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.